So assalamu alaikum uh, to everyone and uh, good evening to all the people who are joining from Bangladesh and uh, some of you joined from North America. So uh, good morning to all of you. Um, and uh, before starting uh, some housekeeping rules, uh, I'll start the session and uh, then after finishing the session, I'll give the question and answer session because if in the meantime, if you have certain questions, that might be answered later. So um, I'll request all of you to um, mute your microphone and uh, then uh, listen to the whole session. And once the session is done, then we'll uh, have a question and answer session. And uh, there are a lot of topics that will be discussed in this uh, session. So it might take a little bit time. So rather than wasting time, let's uh, start. So. In this session, I'll be discussing about uh, the first I'll start about the uh, the headwind for gro global growth and uh, whether the US economy is is in recession or not. We'll look into some historical perspectives and we'll also um, uh, look at the uh, previous episodes of uh, growth and recession. And, and uh, we'll also talk about the current uh, labor shortage in the US economy. Uh, the buzzword about the inflation, uh, inflation in the US, inflation in the UK and the, and the Eurozone. I will also talk about uh, uh, the Russian uh, invasion in the Ukraine and uh, how that unfolded the uh, energy prices. Um, uh, there has been a lot of talk regarding the 1970s and 1980s uh, era of recession and inflation. So the whether um, that stagflation has some resemblance with today's scenario. So and how today's scenario is uh, different from the 1970s and 1980s scenario. Um, that we'll be also be talking about the, what are the policies that are taken by the developed economies to curb the inflation and what will be the impact on those rising interest rate scenario. And also um, uh, we'll be talking about uh, the Chinese slowdown, the Chinese lockdown, and also the Chinese property market. Not only about the Chinese property market, we'll also talk about the uh, property market around the world, especially in the developed economy. Um, and also we'll uh, talk about the recent phenomena of, uh, about the renewed tension over Taiwan. And last of all, we'll finish uh, this session with uh, the Turkish economic growth paradox amid hyperinflation. So. Uh, let's go to the first uh, topic. Um, so the global economy is uh, facing some challenges now. Uh, if you look at the uh, this one, the first chart, if you uh, look at, so you will be able to see that um, this is where in 2020, uh, we had the pandemic hit and we had the sharpest a recession in the history and then with some government measures, especially the aggressive monetary stimulus, we have seen that uh, in 2021, the economy rebound. So you can see there is a V-shaped recovery in 2021, but later on, uh, there has been risk about the inflation. Then in 2022, uh, the Russia invaded Ukraine and the global economy is facing another slowdown amid very, very high um, inflation. So for the advanced economy, uh, there are some challenges because the advanced economy is facing uh, aging population with shrinking labor force growth. Um, uh, they are also, um, uh, re since the economy uh, is facing some uh, population, aging population and shrinking labor force growth, so they have to rely on productivity growth to have the uh, GDP growth. But the problem is, to have that productivity growth, you need to have investment in physical capital, which is muted at this scenario because of the slowdown in the global economy. So the labor productivity is unlikely to grow with significant uh, innovation. So uh, that is a problem. Um, uh, for poorer economies, uh, the lower middle income group uh, suffered tremendously. So for the poorer economy, uh, we have seen that in uh, 2020 pandemic hit and the pandemic is still continuing. So there are a lot of people, a lot of children who lost more than two years of schooling. So that has very uh, large impact in the uh, long run. Um, uh, at the same time, we are facing deglobalization risk, which makes it more difficult for the poor countries to grow and compete with the uh, global world. 
Um, and also, if there is weakness in the four countries, that will have spillover effect on the developed economy, adverse economies as well. So at this moment, the world needs to find the new sources of economic growth. So if the world cannot find new sources of economic growth, in that case, uh, the world will fall back to the secular stagnation. And also, um, uh, if this will be even more problem, because at this moment, most government doesn't have the uh, tools, the fiscal tools and monetary tools, because they have already applied the monetary easing and fiscal stimulus already. So a lot of the countries does not uh, do not have the fiscal capacity to stimulate the economy. There are some tailwinds, uh, which is like uh, we have seen the trade in the uh, goods have reached a limit, but there are massive score, scope for trade in services, especially in the uh, telemedicine, medical services, and many other services where the service can be traded among the world. So that can help the economy to uh, grow. So in this slide, we'll be uh, looking at the US recession history. So the top chart, if you can see, this is the changes from the previous quarter. So GDP growth changes from the previous quarter. So we can see there is a uh, two uh, consecutive quarter of downturn. We have seen that here as well, here as well, here as well. So in the 1990, 2000, 2007, eight crisis, we have seen the US economy uh, gone for recession. And uh, in those recessions, we have seen there is a two or more consecutive quarters of uh, economic downturn. Um, if we look at the uh, bottom chart, you can see that uh, from the 1860 to now, the US economy faced a lot of recession. So these are the bars actually uh, are showing that uh, all the recessions that US economy faced. So uh, if we look at look back with the recession and uh, normally what happens when the recession starts, uh, most people do not know that uh, it is a recession. There has been some debate because the government announcement of the recession comes later. So if you look at this chart uh, in the 1980s, the recession started, obviously there has been a previous recession as well in the 1970s. So in January, 1980, the recession started and the recession ended July, 1980. But if you look at the uh, timeline, when the announcement about the recession, it was in June, 1980. So after that one month, the recession ended but the announcement came in July, 1981. So there has been a lag regarding when the recession starts and when the recession ends uh, versus when the announcement comes. Uh, that is the same case happened here and here and in all the recession. So uh, in all cases, if you look at the 1981 and 82, 1991, uh, 2001, 2007, the global financial crisis and uh, the 2020, this is the, sharpest uh, and sh short, most short-lived uh, recession in the uh, US economy. So there has been a lot of debate going on uh, in the US economy as well, whether the US economy is in recession or not. And if it is in recession, whether this recession will prolong or uh, it will be short-lived like the one we have seen in 2020 pandemic. So if I look at these historical recessions sorted by duration, so the largest duration you can see in the October 19, uh, 1873 recession. That time the recession lasted for more than five years. Um, uh, and in the Great Depression, if you look at in 2000, uh, in the 1929, uh, the recession lasted for 43 months. Uh, more recently, if we look at the 2007 eight global financial crisis, the recession lasted for 18 months. So this 18 months, 43 months, these are the most very, very painful because passing 12 months or more in a recession uh, is, is very, very difficult because uh, at that moment, the business activity slows down, employment, uh, unemployment rate increases, and the most short-lived recession is in February 2020 uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit. In this chart, we'll be looking at the economic indicators uh, 12 months preceding recession. So what happens 12 months preceding recession? So uh, if we look at the last three recessions, uh, 2020, 
2007, 8, uh, 7 to 9, and the uh, 2001. So over the past 12 months, we have seen that growth has slowed in the personal income and manufacturing. And this is the same case happened in 2001 and in 2007 to 9 uh, financial crisis as well. However, uh, the growth in the pro industrial production this time remains very, very strong. And also the number of people employed in the economy has grown faster. In the later section, we'll see that the US economy is suffering from labor shortage and unemployment rate is very, very low. So normally what happens in a typical recession, the economy falls, but um, the number of people uh, employed uh, that reduces as well. So the unemployment rate shoots up. But this time, uh, the number of people employed has grown. In fact, there is so much shortage in the economy that, that employers are uh, increasing the wages to uh, attract the talents as well. So the question is, are we in recession now? So to answer that, we need to look at the definition of recession. So, uh, the rule of thumb or the typical definition that we see in the textbook is the contraction of economy for two consecutive quarters. But that is not the definition that the US economy follows. Uh, the NBER, National Bureau of Economic Research, uh, they have certain definition of recession, which is the significant decline in economic activity that is spread across the economy and that lasts for more than a few months. So what they look at, they look at three things. They look at debt, they look at diffusion, and they look at the duration. So what happened in 2021 uh, and versus 2022, so we have seen that in 2022, the, there has been two consecutive quarters of economic downturn, but surprisingly, the unemployment rate is very, very low. And in a typical recession, what happens in a typical recession, businesses make fewer profits. Businesses lay off workers and people spend less money. That is the uh, archetypal definition of recession. However, this time what happens, if we look at the current scenario, so this time, the consumer sentiment index is down, but the corporate profit margin, though it reduces a little bit, but it is very high compared to the periods of 2001 or compared to the periods of 1970s and 1980s. So as I said, that the National Bureau of Economic Research, they look at the three things, debt, diffusion, and duration. And they look at some of the criteria like GDP growth, employment, household income, consumer income, and the industrial production. So as I said, the industrial production is very strong. Uh, the US consumer are still in the spending B inch and the household income is also uh, it's like very robust and employment is robust as well. So this, is, this chart shows in different recessions, you can see that two charts, one is the downturn of the GDP and the another was increase in uh, unemployment rate. But only this time, the unemployment rate is very, very uh, low. So that is that causes a, a debate uh, about whether um, uh, this time we are in recession or not. So in this time, uh, the recession and unemployment rate. So if we look at that, this time the unemployment rate is very, very low. So there is a debate whether uh, the economy is in recession or not. And uh, there is no formal announcement yet. And also, if we look at this chart, uh, the corporate cash on hand. So at this moment, most corporate has very large cash balances, almost near $4 trillion cumulative amount. And the labor force participation rate from the 2000 level to today, the labor force participation rate is very, very low. So what happens since there is very low labor participation rate, uh, so there is labor shortage in the economy. So there are jobs that are not filled. So the unfilled job rate that increased in the last couple of years. The question is why 
uh, there is that unfilled job rate is increasing. Um, so if we look at 2001 versus uh, this uh, 2022, so in 2001, when we have the recovery, so there has been economic recovery, but that recovery was jobless recovery. And today we are seeing that there is a downturn, but that is job full downturn. So that's the polar opposite of the jobless uh, recovery. So since there is huge labor shortage and employers are uh, trying to increase the salaries to attract employees, so the pay for job switchers, people who are actually switching their job, uh, they are getting a rise and that rise is record high of 6.7% in July throughout the year. So the gap between those who stayed in their current job versus those who switched, it is all time high since 1970, 1997. So to attract the employees, employers are bidding up the wages to attract and also they want to retain their current employees. So question remains why there is labor shortage or why the unfilled job rate is increasing. So if we look at the past two years, especially when the COVID hit. So in 2022, if we look at the uh, number of people who were baby boomers, so a lot of baby boomers retired and a lot of baby boomers were very close to their retirement age. So when the pandemic hit, many of the baby boomers go for early retirement. And since they have gone for retirement and they are very close to their retirement age, the chances of them to be coming back is very, very low. Obviously, there has been a lot of uh, money pumped into the economy uh, through fiscal stimulus. So a lot of people had lots of money and many people um, just like left the job, started speculating in the stock market, meme stocks and all these things, and also in the crypto market. Uh, however, uh, the Federal Reserve baited that some of the young population who left the job, they will come back. But the people who were close to their retirement, they are very uh, less likely to come back to the uh, labor force. So as a result, many Americans retired and the number of late number of people participated in the labor force reduced. A lot of demands for goods and services during the pandemic because uh, the people were in home, so they had they had nothing to do. They could not go out of home. So they gone and and on top of that they got the fiscal stimulus um so what they did they bought they bought gym equipments they bought televisions computers mobiles and all the things they started to buy and since in 2020 they could not um, buy many other things or many services so obviously when the economy rebounded it uh, the lockdown was over in 2021 there has been a lot of pent up demand so they had the money, they had the pent up demand. So there has been also the value of stock was going up in 2021 and their assets going up. So ultimately many boomers afford to retire early because they have seen their portfolio value gone up as well. So towards the end of 2021, so there has been a risk of inflation. So the inflation is back. If you look at the two cover photos of the Economist magazine, so in October 29, that were that was a special report by the Economist, and the cover the cover feature was the end of inflation. So they feel a bit proud because they uh, added a question mark here, um, and then very next year, uh, late uh, this uh, late uh, December uh, in 2020. So then the cover feature was, will inflation return? So inflation is back in late 2021 and it accelerated early 2022 and it, is, it accelerated faster after the Russian invasion in Ukraine. So to understand the inflation, so let's look at the basic definition of inflation. So it's the rise in average prices measured as prices of a basket of goods and services. So we look at consumer price index in most countries. Some countries also follow producer's price index as well. So for inflation to happen, the, price, the rise of prices has to be broad-based, which means if any one or two 
products price increases that we don't call that inflation because that's a changes in the relative prices but when the prices of almost everything going up that is happening nowadays in all over the world so then we call it an inflation and also the rate of inflate the, the rate of price increase has to be sustained sustained uh, it's not like today the price gone up and then the price will go down that's not it has to be sustained changes in the prices so question is why we do care about the inflation so the first one is that inflation affects the prices of everything so over the economy the most uh, prices gone up most products and services uh, the prices of most products and services are going up and also when there is too much inflation the inflation is very high it is very very hard for people to make long term decision because if you want to price a product if you want to lock in for rent for 3 years or 4 years or 5 years you can't do that in a very rising and volatile inflation so for taking long term decision we need a stable scenario so in a very um, high inflationary scenario people go for short term things so the question is why we are experiencing the inflation now one i have already talked about the pent up demand as countries emerge from the lockdown and also there has been a lot of money pumped in the us economy and also in many other economy there has been a lot of fiscal stimulus to revive the economy from the damage taken by the um, uh, because of the pandemic and also in the developed economy we have seen that the also the food prices are increasing obviously that accelerated after the russian invasion in uh, ukraine uh, but if we look at the product pricing in developed economy only 15 to 20% of what people spend on food actually goes on food so where does the spending of another 80% goes so the majority of the spending goes on labor delivering processing retailing advertising since the there is labor shortage and wages increased so obviously those component has gone up and also the globally if we look at the inflation basket crude oil has 2.5% weight in the typical inflation basket so when crude oil increased by 100% that's another 2 and a half percent increase in inflation that took place and in fact from 2020 uh, the crude oil increased by few fold more than three times so what are the contributions contributors to inflation in the us and europe so if we look at why there is inflation so one is the stimulus check in the 2020 pandemic there has been a lot of supply shortage one is the labor labor shortage but another one is the uh, covid lockdown prolonged covid lockdown in china so because of that china is a major supplier in many of the world advanced countries for example apple produces phone but a lot of those phone are actually uh, the work goes on in china so Fox, if foxconn does cannot work because of the lockdown then apple has uh, finding it difficulty to uh, produce iphone ipad and so on so because of the chinese prolonged lockdown uh, that uh, that obviously very recently uh, they opened up a little bit but uh, since 2020 uh, 2020 they have gone for prolonged lockdown so there has been a supply shortage uh, in the chinese economy as well so it's not about the labor shortage it's about the supply chain disruptions as well and on top of that when the russian invade russian invaded to ukraine so that uh, accelerated the energy crisis we'll talk about that later and also the chinese economy is slowing down so since the chinese economy is slowing down the the second largest economy in the world so their demands are slowing down as well so the countries that are that are the exporter to china so uh, their exports are being affected as well so we'll talk about the russian invasion we'll talk about the chinese slowdown later in this section so if we look out look at this chart the united states and euro area so we can see that the euro area are very vulnerable to energy so what happened uh, after the invasion europe hit very hard compared to the us and on the other hand in us the services component is a big part compared to the euro so because of the labor shortage uh, because of the increase in wages us are affected because of the service uh, inflation as well 
So we can see that in the G10 countries, very recently, there has been a massive growth in wages. Think about whether this inflation is demand driven or because of, or, or whether it's supply driven. So in US, a big thing affected is the pandemic driven stimulus and the pent up demand. So lots of, lots of people left the workforce and they are unlikely to come. So that's why big there is labor shortage. And also Fed betted that the labor will come back, but later they realized a lot of people who retired, they are not coming back to the labor force. In the Eurozone, uh, the energy and commodity price hike due to Russian invasion affected a lot. And in the US, in, so we can see that in the US, the inflation is more demand driven. And in the euro area, the inflation is more supply driven. Obviously, both demand pool and the uh, both the uh, both the cost push and demand pool both are affecting the inflation. But the US in US, the dominant factor is the demand, and in eurozone, the dominant factor is um, uh, supply shortage or the energy price increase. We can see that there has been a massive um, increase in the. Fed's balance sheet during the 2020 and 2021. So the, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet uh, increased more than, uh, it, it, it become more than double so compared to where it was before the COVID-19 pandemic. We, can, we, we also look at the Britain. So Britain's cost of living is also increasing. In fact, uh, the Bank of England, they predicted that inflation might rise to 13% this October. And of this increase, half of the increase will be driven by steep rise, rises in the energy prices. So the Eurozone and also the UK are, as, are a major uh, loser because of the Russian invasion in the Ukraine because of the rise in energy prices. So from the household's average annual energy bills, they have seen that it already increased to um, the 1,971 pound. It increased a lot in the last one year, but they are expecting from this level, it will go to 4,427 in April. And obviously, whenever there is an increase in, in energy prices, the natural gas and oil prices, the poor people are, are affected a lot more compared to the rich people because the poor have bigger share of their energy budget than the rich people. So this is what we see that uh, the consumer price index in the UK increased. Uh, people are spending less on uh, non-essential items. Uh, their energy bill increased a lot and uh, the rising prices, and, and because of the uh, rising prices, they are focusing on more um, monetary tightening to combat the um, inflation. So many people are uh, talking about the 1970s and 1980s era of um, uh, inflation. And in today's inflation have some similarities in compared to the 1970s and 1980s. Um, uh, but there are many differences uh, today compared to the 1970s and 80s inflation. So the number one is the magnitude of the commodity price jump. So in the 1973 and 1974, oil price quadrupled. And then it doubled again in 1979 to 1980. In recent times, we can see that uh, the oil price increased, but that prices have roughly tripled from their lows in the 2020 and doubled since early 2021. So this rise is a lot less compared to the 1973, 74, and 79, 80s era of um, uh, increase in oil prices. The second one is the global headline inflation and core inflation. So there has been steep global inflation during the 1970s and 80s, and that acceleration was more broad-based across all the sectors. Today, the global headline inflation is still less broad-based compared to the 1970s and 80s, and core inflation has remained relatively low today compared to the 1970s. There has been a stark difference between the unemployment rate. So unemployment rate increased to double digit in 1970s and 80s, but um, uh, in 2022, uh, the unemployment rate is very, very low. In fact, it is at its historical, almost historical low time. Uh, on the monetary uh, policy, uh, that time US economy, especially the US Central Bank was suffering from lack of credibility. So 
in the 1970s and 80s the federal reserve monetary policies was still accommodating um, and there was less credibility about their monetary policy but today central bank has um, defined a rule about the price stability they are more um, uh, slight firm about their target inflation level so today the monetary policy is more credible compared to the 1970s and 80s uh, the economy is more flexible today considerable structural rigidities was there in the 1970s and 80s since the central bank did not um, tighten the economy as fast at, as it would have needed in the 1970s they have gone for wage price and wage controls to control the inflation but today uh, the wage prices uh, um, are more flexible uh, most of the economic uh, tools are more flexible compared to the 1970s and 80s fiscal policy in the 1960s and 1970s and uh, there was huge expansionary fiscal policy uh, fiscal policy was expansionary during that 2020 as well because of the pandemic but today uh, in most countries there has been fiscal policy tightening as well to combat the inflation as well in addition to the monetary policy tightening so like the 1980s era the developed economy central banks are raising interest rates sharply to fight the inflation so let's talk about the russia's invasion and energy prices so if you look at this chart the Rush, the share of uh, global energy exports so on natural gas uh, russia is a major player on coal they have almost more than 17 percent uh, exposure and crude oil is roughly over 10 percent uh, if we look at the commodity price changes so there has been a massive changes in the commodity prices um, uh, compared to the 1970 and 80 uh, if we look at the real coal and oil prices uh, today's price has increased a lot especially if we look at the uh, red line the red line is for euro area um, uh, natural gas euro area and the blue line is natural gas us so there has been a huge difference between the natural gas price that eurozone faces compared to the us we can also see the real coal and oil prices there has been a massive differences as well and also uh, the real natural gas prices compared to the 1970s the real natural gas prices today is extremely high so the russia's invasion disrupted the global energy market and as a result the countries that are dependent on energy import so they are facing very high prices that will reduce the real disposable income and that will raise the production cost as well and which will affect inflation further and uh, they have financial condition that is very tight and uh, they have to face very constrained policy to move from their current scenario however there are some uh, countries who are the energy exporters so they are they are actually a major beneficiary from uh, Russian invasion to Ukraine. So obviously the Europe suffered a lot uh, because of the Russian invasion, because especially because of the natural gas prices. However, within the Eurozone, there has been some massive differences within the countries as well. So if we look at this chart, uh, France, Finland, Germany, they are in a much much better scenario compared to the britain compared to italy or estonia czech republic so obviously there has been a stark difference some european countries are more vulnerable to uh, natural gas prices compared to others so on average europeans spend one tenth of their incomes on energy uh, sweden is in a uh, better scenario as well uh, they have less than 3% of their energy comes from natural gas uh, because they uh, focus more on hydroelectricity, wind and nuclear providing. Uh, that is the bulk of their energy sources. So the dependence on natural gas is a big problem. So, um, and also the coal prices increased a lot as well. So obviously the countries that are more dependent on natural gas and there has been a massive increase in natural gas prices so many demands are shifting from natural gas to oil so as a result 
the demand for oil is increasing. So um, we can see that in the world, oil consumption increased to 380,000 barrel per day to from 380,000 to 2.1 million barrel per day. So that's a massive, ma massive increase of 380,000 barrel. So obviously it was below 2, 2 million barrel per day, but today is more than 2.1 million barrel per day. Natural gas and electricity prices increased and uh, the incentive for, for the consumers to switch from natural gas to uh, oil increase. So as a, as a result, there has been some risk of supply crunch in the oil market as well. However, um, uh, the good news is that there has been enough stockpiles projected, uh, which is uh, at a rate of 900,000 barrel per day for the rest of the world. So Russia's oil output um, uh, was more robust as well because we expected because of the sanction provided by internet, because of the international sanction, the Russian output will slow down, but their output proved to be very robust as well. Good news is that on the in the US, the gasoline prices came down uh, very recently. The gasoline prices came down to $4 uh, per gallon, which are easing the inflationary pressures as well. And very recently, in the uh, month of July, we have seen that inflation uh, number is lower compared to the month of uh, June. So most of the developed economies are actually increasing the interest rate faster to uh, tackle the, um, the inflation. So the question is, what does high interest rate mean for that developed economy? So as a result of the monetary tightening and also uh, US is tightening at a more faster rate compared to the uh, UK and Eurozone. So because of the tightening, uh, the demand for US dollar is increasing. As a result, dollar increased at a very high, dollar increased sharply compared to the all major currencies. So in this chart, you can see that the dollar index rises sharply in the last two years. Um, obviously, uh, the question is why uh, the dollar is extremely strong. So one of the reasons is since the interest rate in the US is very high. So money from the emerging economy is going out and moving into the US and dollar is considered as a safe haven. So there has been some fight, flight to quality as well. Everyone is talking about recession, but the US economy is doing much better than other economy. I have already discussed about that part. And also the surge is uh, less to do with US rather other countries having more downturns on a relative basis, US is doing relatively better than other countries, especially the Eurozone and UK. So money is going more to the US as a result, dollar is increasing. With high interest rate, obviously there will be high mortgage rate and credit card rates, housing, there will be more housing correction and negative wealth effect. I'll talk about that uh, in the later slides as well. But uh, at this moment, I'll be focusing on what that high interest rate mean for emerging economies. So we have seen that what high interest rate mean for a developed economy, but for emerging economy, uh, the characteristics is a bit different. So because of the high interest rate, one is happening is that the dollar is increasing. So many emerging countries have dollar denominated debt. So when they want to service their debt, so obviously they have to pay more local currency to pay off their uh, liabilities. Um, and since these emerging countries uh, fiscal deficit has increased in the last two years as well, because many of the emerging countries also followed uh, fiscal stimulus to revive from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So obviously the fiscal deficit as a percentage of GDP increased in most of the emerging economy as well. So there is less fiscal space to stimulate the economy and a lot of these um, uh, emerging and frontier economies are facing slowdown risk. Obviously, um, some of the frontier economies might grow at a good pace, but many emerging countries are actually facing um, the weaker growth and uh, they are also facing rating downgradation. And what happens because of the weaker growth and rating downgradation, they are ill spread compared to the US Treasury uh, bond is increasing. At the same time, US, the rate for US Treasury bond is increasing as well. 
So the rate for the required rate of return for holding emerging market and frontier market bond increased. And on top of that, there is strong dollar. So there are a lot of headwinds faced by emerging market economists. So they, many of the economists are facing their debt vulnerabilities. We have already seen a few of the emerging economists already defaulted on their debt as well. Very recently, Ghana gone for um, a bailout from IMF 18th time, 1-8. So with strong dollar, what's happening, the US is facing a good scenario. So with strong dollar, the US is actually exporting the inflation. So what happens, uh, US has a very large current account deficit as well compared to like many emerging uh, countries. But since they have that reserve currency and dollar is getting stronger and stronger and they are proven, they are uh, acting as a safe haven. So obviously the US people got the stimulus check, their currency appreciated against all the major currencies. So they are being able to buy things from an another country at a very cheap rate. So they are, as a result, they are, spending is also increased. So as a result, they are actually demanding a lo lot of goods from other countries. So as a result, their demand is pushing up the prices in the, uh, the countries from where they are uh, importing. So the rising rates are good for savers, but bad for spenders. So ultimately, uh, if we look at this chart, the household cash and cash equivalent holdings, that is at the highest compared to, to if we look at the last five, six years, it is at the highest level. So when there is a rise in interest rate, uh, they are getting more <coughs> interest income. So savers are getting benefited. Uh, but for the spenders, the credit card, the credit card average annual percentage rate will uh, jump. Um, uh, currently, the average APR with good credit is 18.84%. It is likely to go up. Buying car becomes very expensive. The car market remains hot in the US. Uh, car loans typically have fixed interest rate pegged to treasury yields since the treasury yields are going up. So the uh, rate for car loan will go up as well. The interest, loan, the interest rate on the federal student loans is set every May um, as per 10 year treasury auction. So since we are already in August uh, 2022, so the next revision will take place next year, May. So uh, there is less likely that federal student loan rate will go up, but the private student loan charge, uh, they charge fixed rate and variable rate as well. That rate might go up because they have, uh, their cost of uh, fund will uh, go up. So because of the very high interest rate, uh, because of the monetary tightening and interest rates are going up, the mortgage rates has gone up. So very recently, we have seen that the mortgage rates gone up above 5%. It is uh, it, it went up to close to 6%. Recently in the May, it gone down, but again, it gone up. So not only that mortgage interest rate has gone up, the house prices in the US is historic high. So a median um, uh, house prices are more than $400,000. So what is happening, many people cannot afford to uh, buy houses. So their housing affordability index is going down. Housing prices has gone up in the last two years and average 30 year mortgage rate gone up. So these are the three things affecting the ability of the uh, people to buy houses. So people are expecting there will be some slow down or contraction in the housing prices in the US as well because of the three catalysts. So let's move to China. So as we have uh, said in the first few slides that China is slowing down very recently, the GDP number came worse than expected. So uh, what's happening after four decades of growth, 1980s, 90s, 2000 and 2010, uh, so we can see that the China is expected to grow at 3.2%, 3 which is extremely low compared to their last 40 years average. And since they have a huge population and second largest economy in the world, so they are slow down mean for the world economy. So what's happening? They are importing less. So 
they import uh, machinery and high tech goods that that import slump. Uh, recently, uh, the Japanese export to China picked up a little bit, but that will be uh, the expectation is that that will be short lived. There has been slump in the uh, real estate sector in uh, China. It started with the Evergrande crisis last year, and not only Evergrande, many property um, uh, uh, real estate companies are suffering. So there has been a massive shock in the property market uh, in the China, and it was uh, government driven. Uh, they wanted that property market to slow down because it hit a bubble uh, scenario. And to recover from the slowdown of the economic activity, uh, they need to avoid lockdown in the second half of this year. Otherwise, the slowdown uh, might be even worse. So we can see that the Chinese export has export growth has gone down as well. Uh, in the later section, I'll focus on the Chinese property market as well. So not only that China is slowing down and also not only that the property market is suffering, the China is facing demographic crisis as well. If you we look at this demographic population pyramid, here you can see that from zero to 15 year people that shrink. So there are not many children at the bottom of the pyramid who will come to the labor force in the next five to 10 years. On the other hand, the people who are in the late uh, 40s or late 50s, this number of people in this arena is lot high. So uh, they will uh, soon retire, especially in the period of 2030-35. So the problem of Chinese people becoming aged and at the same time, the China, the China is no longer cheap. So the Chinese labor uh, cost has gone up as well. So as a result, uh, that this demographic crisis is affecting the China. And if you if we all know that in the 1980s, they have gone for that one child policy that affected them a lot. But when they have gone for two child policy or nowadays there has been some um, uh, incentive for three child, but people uh, like forgot how to uh, produce baby. So as a result, um, uh, the Chinese economy is facing some demographic crisis. And in fact, the US is a lot younger compared to the China. And that is a major headwind for Chinese growth. On top of that, it is probably the worst timing for the uh, Pelosi to visit Taiwan. So uh, why they picked this time to this around after this Russian invasion to Ukraine, why they picked this month to visit Taiwan, that is a mystery. So China declared her visit as maniac, as manic, irresponsible and highly rational act. They're also saying that it's a violation of commitment U.S. made during the 1979 when, the, when they recognized the People Republic of China. Since uh, Ms. Pelosi left Taiwan, China actually uh, has fired ballistic missile over the island for the first time. They sent military ships, aircraft across the, um, the median line of the Taiwan Strait. So China has also imposed economic sanction, sanctions on Taiwan as well. Uh, the Taiwan foreign uh, minister uh, accused China of using this visit as an excuse to rehearse their invasion plan. So they are fearing that China might invade Taiwan as well. And if that happens, that might be another blow to the world economy. The spillover effect of Chinese property market slum, I already talked about the Chinese property market. So if you look at the China's housing market peaked here and it's gone down, it, it, it is slowing down and the growth sales of residential buildings in China that is facing negative growth. So there has been a massive bubble in the Chinese property market and people are expecting uh, this Chinese property market will have a major negative effect on the China's economic growth. In fact, many people are saying that it is more worse compared to the, the effect is more worse compared to the uh, Chinese uh, lockdown. It's not about only China and US. The global housing market may slow down in the coming days as well. Um, if we look at this, this chart, if you look at, uh, this is a house price growth is forecast to, uh, how, uh, this, is called, this is a 
like chart compared to the like people's affordability. So annual percentage change. If you look at since people affordability is lower, they are expecting a negative growth in the housing market. Not only that, the house price increased massively in the last 10 years, especially in the last two years, there's a huge increase in house prices um, uh, from the start of the pandemic. And the inventory of the US residentially property sales is low as well. So the boom in house prices growth uh, is expected to slow down. And because of that less affordability, there, there are less eligible buyers for buying home because the, um, the house price multiple over the rent is very, very high. So people will find it very difficult to afford house, housing and also they might not get better financing as well because the mortgage rates are increasing as well. So if the US tighten a lot faster, then mortgage rates will go up as well. But there is a benefit of um, the house price slowdown because um, uh, housing is a major component in the inflation basket as well. So if the housing market goes down, so inflation may not rise as fast as it, as it expected. In that case, the required tightening by the Fed that might be lower. So there is some um, uh, offsetting benefit of housing slowdown as well. The last topic I'll touch upon is the paradox of Turkish economic uh, growth. Uh, it's like if we know about Turkey, Turkey has a high history of very high inflation and um, very recently they are facing hyperinflation. So because of some unorthodox policies followed by uh, their president Erdogan, the Turkish uh, inflation rate went to 80%. But remember, that's the inflation rate. That is the uh, published inflation rate. Many people are saying that actual inflation rate is a lot higher compared to the 80%. So despite very high, high inflation or hyperinflation, the industrial production rose by 9.1% in May and economy grew at 11% rate. The Turks are very low saving countries as well. So they save uh, less as a result a low saving countries experience current account deficit. So they have persistent levels of current account deficit. So a country that has persistent current account deficit, they need a lot of financing in the capital account. But they artificially reduce their interest rate at a level which is absolutely, um, it's like uh, people cannot make any sense of. So as a result, the foreign capital is, going out from stocks and bonds to other countries. So to attract foreign capital, the Turks need to increase the interest rate, but they are following the opposite because the Mr. Erdogan believe high interest rate is not a recipe for um, uh, re reduction of inflation. Rather, he believes it's a cause for inflation. So that is something he thinks if anyone wants to increase the in interest rate, he treats them as a traitor. So not only that, Tars are major importer of energy as well. And much of its gas is supplied by Russia and Iran. So TAR actually needs foreign capital, but for that they need to keep their interest at high. But they are actually keeping their interest at low. And since a lot of capital is flowing out from Lira deposit to dollar deposit or euro deposit, Lira tumbled in the last three years. So there has been a massive uh, depreciation of Turkish Lira. Uh, the current account balance is in the negative territory. Um, real trade weighted exchange rate is down and the foreign direct investment reduced as well. However, there are some benefits uh, of uh, Turkey has certain uh, benefits. One is that they have a very large domestic market with 85 million young consumers. And the Turkish business scenario, if you look at, a lot like Bangladesh, they have large conglomerates. And those large conglomerates account for 25% of the total employment and half of the business sector's value added. They also manufacture very high quality capital goods, car parts, military hardware. These are for exports. And since there has been a massive depreciation of Turkish lira, 
um, uh, their export competitiveness has gone up. So they had very high inflation scenario in the, um, in the past, but um, uh, they believe uh, the response to adversity is to work harder. So normally the Turkish people work a lot harder. 80% of the workforce put more than 40 hours a week in their main job. That is a lot higher compared to their counterpart. And despite high inflation, there's, there is very, uh, like the consumer spending is very, very uh, strong. So what is happening? The collapse of Lira is helping their export to boost. Um, uh, and also it is the exchange, real exchange rate that matters for export competitiveness. So Turkish real exchange rate has been falling since 2015. Another big benefit that Turkish economy has because the cost of shipping. So the cost of shipping from Turkey to Europe is far lower from the cost of shipping from China to Europe. So goods can be shipped from the airport um, uh, within 72 hours compared to China where it takes minimum a month. So three days versus one month. So that's a major benefit that Tars have. So they have the ports. So obviously they are getting that benefit. So the cost of shipping is a lot lower. Some European bosses are also seeing Turkey as a potential alternative to China because when the COVID hit, many, many producers thought that uh, obviously they have to shift their manufacturing activity from, to, from China to other countries. So they want to have their supply chain diversification so many European uh, bosses thinking that Turkey can be a major alternative to China um, uh, and they are going for that as well. Obviously, there are many risks. Obviously, the biggest risk Turkish have is the foreign currency. Their foreign uh, currency reserve is extremely low and many um, uh, like countries may not give, their, give them the credit line. So the potential credit crunch is a major risk factor for uh, the Turkish economy. Um, uh, however, they have the benefit of very low public debt to GDP ratio, which is only less than 42% of uh, GDP. So obviously, despite having very uh, large, uh, very high inflation, hyperinflation, there are some underlying benefits that Turkey has. And because of that, they are growing amid hyperinflation. And that's all about uh, this session. So time for question and answer. So if you have any queries, uh, feel free to uh, raise. You can speak up and raise, uh, ask questions.